What's up guys, welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ardell, and today we have our fifth installment of the subscriber game analysis series where you guys send in one of your games and it has a chance to be analyzed on this channel. Now you guys could send in a game from somewhere like Lee Chess or Chess.com, an over the board tournament game or even notation from a game that you just had with a friend. Today's game was sent in by none other than my Garza Mod and his username is FuriousBiker999. Here he played a great 10 minute game on Lee Chess and it all starts off with Sarmad playing the move e4 and then facing the somewhat rare Owens defense. I honestly think that this opening deserves more attention than it has. It's a very strong system and many players with the white pieces have had trouble going against it, including myself. Now here we see white continue with knight f3, followed by the move d3. Now at first sight, this may seem a little bit passive. Why are we playing knight f3, e4, and then playing a move like d3, which kind of locks in our bishop? Well, surprisingly, at the master and grandmaster level, this actually does very well with a very good percentage of games. Here we see the move e6, and in this position, Sarma continued with knight c3, but I personally kind of like the system in which we play g3, looking to fianch head of the bishop on g2 here after a move like knight f6 we can simply castle kingside bring our rook to e1 just in case things ever break open and now against a move like bishop e7 we play knight d2 c3 a4 you get the idea this is very similar to a king's indian attack notice here how i didn't spend a ton of time going over what black would do this is a setup that we can get against the Owens defense every single time, unless they play the move d5, in which case we'll have to deal with that. But even then, I think that d3 offers this e4 pawn some very nice support. But guys, as mentioned earlier, we didn't see this g3 move, but instead saw knight c3, which by the way, is completely fine. Here white just naturally developing their pieces. Here black continue with knight f6, and we now see bishop e2, and following bishop b4, we see bishop d2 supporting this knight on c3. And now after castling king's side, white plays a3, wasting no time and making black make a choice with what to do with this bishop on b4. Does black want to take the knight on c3 or do they run away? Notice here, if black does play bishop a5, we're simply going to trap that bishop. So here black really needs to take the knight or play bishop e7. Bishop e7 was played and honestly, I think that this is the better move. There's just no reason to give white the bishop pair this early in the game. And here we see Sarmad play the best move in the position with e5 attacking that minor piece and then the very next move supporting that pawn on e5. Now these pawns on d4 and e5 are both very strong and giving us an advantage in space. We just have to be a little bit careful that they don't become huge weaknesses. Here black plays the move d6 already trying to undermine our pawn on e5 and here white captures the knight on d5 and then the very next move plays bishop d3. I actually kind of like this move from white, getting this bishop to a more active square. Now the bishop on e2 wasn't terrible, but at the same time it wasn't doing very much. Why not bring it to d3 and get this bishop more involved eyeing that pawn on h7? As you guys are going to see, this move had huge payoffs in this game. Here black took the pawn on e5, and here we simply took back with our d pawn. And now following the move knight d7, we see queen e2. Again, I like like this idea bishop d3 activating that bishop giving some space for that queen on e2 and here white does have a very subtle idea and that's that their king still has flexibility we can castle kingside at any moment we want or we could also castle queenside if we castle kingside we're probably going to put our rooks on e1 and d1 and really try to make some pressure right in the center of the board really assert our presence towards those two middle files and if we castle queenside we have two very active bishop pouncing down on the opponent's king we could throw this h pawn down the board like it's nobody's business and we're going to have some very fun and aggressive chess here black played the move c5 expanding on the king's side and we see sarma continue with c4 simply expanding on the king's side stopping this pawn from ever going any further and kicking this bishop back to b7 here white continues with h4 and really by this move white is making a statement they're not trying to castle kingside because here let's just say black played a move like a6 and we castle kingside we would simply lose that pawn on h4 so here by playing the move h4 white is making their intentions clear they are trying to checkmate this king on g8 with both of these bishops pouncing down on h7 and h6 a knight that can now go into g5 at a moment's notice and a queen that is ready to get activated as well 
And now from black, we see the move h6. And I just want to let you guys know, we need to be very careful when moving pawns in front of our king. Now by playing the move h6, yes, it does take away that g5 square from the knight, but at the same time, this h6 pawn is now a bigger weakness. With the pawn on h7, it's a lot harder to create any kind of weakness, but with the pawn on h6, the weakness and the target is already there. So just something to keep in mind. Here white played the move h5 yet again, just trying to take as much space as possible. And here black played the move bishop takes f3. I don't really like this move from black at all. Now, first off, this knight on f3 couldn't go to g5 anymore because of the move h6. I mean, let's just think about black's last three moves. Black went bishop b7 and then went h6 so that knight g5 couldn't be played. And then they took the knight on f3. They could have done what they did in three moves in just one by simply taking the knight. Here, black has wasted a ton of time. And now we see the move g takes f3. Some of you are probably wondering, why are we taking with the pawn? Well, the issue with queen takes f3 is that knight takes e5 can be played, forking both our queen. And no matter what white does, the next move, black is going to capture our bishop, be up a piece in a pawn. And this position is resignable for white. So here Samad was very smart to keep defending that pawn on e5 and simply capture back with the pawn. Now usually guys in chess, I don't recommend doubling your pawns, but in this position, I actually think that it's okay. A general rule is that you shouldn't double your pawns, but sometimes it's actually a good thing. I think it is here because we now have this G file open, which is going to be a very nice square for one of our rooks, in addition to both of our bishops pouncing down on h7 and h6. Here we see the move bishop g5, and yet again, black is just wasting time. Now, from one perspective, this seems like a good move in terms of chess strategy. When you are attacking, you don't want to trade down pieces because you're losing firepower. When you're getting attacked, you do want to trade down because the more you trade down, the more simplified the game gets and the less attacking pieces they have. So here black is trying to trade off with our bishop on d2. But guys, we are trying to checkmate the king on g8. We're not going to take the bishop, but instead play f4 and really force this bishop right back to e7. I mean, I guess black could have played a move like bishop h4, but what on earth is that bishop actually doing? I mean, really, it's just making this queen a prisoner to defending it. And we can always play a move like queen g4, forcing that bishop yet again right back to that e7 square. So notice here, black had already wasted three moves by playing bishop b7, h6, and then capturing our knight on f3. And now they play the moves bishop g5 and bishop e7. Guys, time is important in chess. Every single move, you want to continue to make your position better and not simply move back and forth. And here from white, we see the move castling queenside. I absolutely love this idea. If we're trying to attack the king on g8, it's generally better to have our king on the opposite side of the board. With our king on g1, it becomes a little bit more of a target, whereas the king on c1, we can put our king on this side of the board, throw all of our pieces towards this king, and try to win the game quickly. Now here black played the move a6, which yet again, I don't really think does much. Now yes, if black had an unlimited amount of time, they could play a6, b5, rook b8, I mean, just try to break this game open. But guys, they've wasted so much time already that they're simply too far behind. Here we see the move rook d to g1. Again, amazing score for this rook, really pouncing down on that g7 pawn. And now we start to see black playing defensive chess with king h8, getting this king out of the way of that rook. And here we see the move queen g4, but there was actually a crushing idea for white. Pause the video if you'd like and try to see what you would play in this position. We'll assume you guys pause the video and try to find what the best move was. Here white has the crushing idea of rook takes g7. I mean, just giving up a rook, saying, hey, I'm going to take your pawn. Here's my rook. Whole idea being after king takes g7, we have rook g1 check. If a move like bishop g5, I mean, we simply take the bishop and we have a rook, two bishops, and a queen all attacking this king on g7, which really doesn't have hardly any defense. And white is simply winning there. And following the move king h8, we have a very forceful line with queen e4 threatening a mate in one and following f5 we use the role of en passant we take on f6 and following knight takes f6 which looks to attack our queen and defend h7 we simply play the move queen g6 we're threatening both queen g7 and queen takes h6 the only way for black to stay alive here is by giving up the rook with rook f7 and black can honestly resign so guys, Sarmad did miss that rook takes g7 idea. However, I can hardly blame him. That's a very hard move to find. And in some sense, it may be a little bit risky, right? I mean, you're playing a 10-minute game on Lee Chess. 
why not just take the more simple route? Here he plays the move queen g4, threatening a mate in one, and black plays the move rook g8. Notice here that black actually utilized a key defensive idea that you can sometimes use in your own games by moving the king to the corner and then playing rook g8, defending the pawn on g7 if you're ever feeling the pressure. Now here in this position, I personally kind of like the move rook h3, using this rook lift, eyeing potential rook g3 ideas, but here white plays the move f5. Now if we play this move, a move earlier with our queen on e2, that would have been completely okay because this pawn on e5 was defended. Here black took the pawn on f5, but they missed a huge opportunity in that this pawn is now hanging. Black simply could have took the pawn on e5, and all of a sudden, white is losing this game. That is the beauty and almost the difficulty of chess, right? I mean, you play a great game up to move 21, you make one small mistake, and then all of a sudden you're simply losing. Here this knight is forking both the queen and the bishop on d3, and there's no checkmate heroics that white can pull out here against that king. And after a move like queen e2, black's simply going to capture the bishop with check. And yes, after king c2, this knight is trapped in one sense. I mean, if it goes to e5, we capture it. If it goes to f4, we capture it. So why not get something out of it? Play the move knight takes b2. Whole idea being after king takes b2, we have bishop f6. Now our king is being attacked. Black's going to capture on f5, and black's simply winning. However, following the move f5, our guy Sermod was very lucky in that black did not take the pawn on e5 and instead took the pawn on f5. Now, this was a bad move because knight takes e5 was missed, but I also think that this was a doubly bad move because it allows queen takes f5, and all of a sudden, we have a battery ram on the b1 to h7 diagonal threatening a checkmate in one against that king. And again, guys, as mentioned earlier, we need to be really careful when moving pawns in front of our king. In this position, we are threatening a checkmate in one on h7, but I think that black simply should have played knight f8 defending that threat. By playing this, the pawn structure stays intact, and yes, white is still winning that position, but black does have somewhat of a chance to maybe hang on. By playing the move g6, you have two bishops, a queen, and two rooks all directed towards your king on h8. You never want to play a move like g6 because it simply allows the opponent to break this game open. Here white took that pawn right off the board, and after the move f takes g6, white starts to pick these pawns off like candy with rook takes h6 attacking the king. And after king g7, the very nice checkmating idea, rook g takes g6. It's been a while since I've seen a checkmate like this with our rook and queen on the f and h files, and then our rook on g6 finishing off this checkmate. Now guys, the two big takeaways from this game. What can we take away from this game, both the good moves and the bad moves? Well, first off guys, the number one lesson that I encourage you guys to bring into your own games, do not waste time. Don't move pieces back and forth, or don't take away a threat that say a knight is threatening, and then just take the knight with the bishop the very next move. If you're going to do that, just take the knight, and then the very next move you can go on with your plan. And on top of that, guys, I think that king safety is very important, specifically not pushing pawns in front of your king. Now, there are times where pushing the pawns in front of your king are okay. I myself do it from time to time. However, most of the time, guys, when you push pawns in front of your king, they simply become a weakness, and they don't help you whatsoever. Develop your pieces, keep your king safe, and we're just playing chess. If you guys would like to learn the theory behind the hippopotamus defense, a very strong system that you could play with white or black, click the video to the left. If you'd like to see our entire openings playlist, click the video to the right. Leave a comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.